Uh, it's a big pleasure to be here today in Korea and uh, uh, it's nice to have this opportunity to uh, talk about this. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Bae for the nice uh, uh, organization of this workshop. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, uh, basically the question of how many uh, rational points a curve uh, defined over a finite field can have and I'll show how um, the theory of Trinfeld modules can be used to uh, obtain curves with many points. Yeah? So let me start by um, introducing very quickly what the question is. So uh, I'll be interested in smooth, projective, absolutely irreducible curves defined over a finite field. So when I say curve, I will always mean a smooth, projectively, projective, absolutely irreducible curve defined over a finite field FQ. Or if you want, you can think of the corresponding function field, so you'll have an algebra break function field of one variable um, with full constant field given F as fq and um, I'm interested today in the set of uh, rational points of such a curve so more precisely in the set of fq rational points so points which have all their coordinates in the finite field fq and since uh, fq is a finite field um, the number of rational points on such a curve will be uh, finite and the question is what can you say about this finite number of rational points that you have uh, on such a curve and uh, so historically maybe one of the biggest results in uh, on this topic is uh, uh, a consequence of, the, of a big theorem by Hasse-Weyl, which basically states that given uh, a curve over a, f uh, over a finite field, you can associate to it uh, a zeta function in total analogy with the classical Riemann zeta function. And the theorem of Hasse-Weyl states that uh, um, the Riemann hypothesis uh, holds for the zeta function that you associate to these curves over finite fields. And since the zeta function encodes a lot about the informatic, uh, encodes a lot of information about the arithmetic of the curve, you expect that as a consequence of this theorem, um, you should get some uh, um, corollaries on the number of rational points, and that is indeed the case. I mean, uh, immediate corollary is uh, the following. If you have a curve C defined over a finite field FQ, with Q elements of genus uh, G, then the number of rational points on such a curve is upper bounded by Q plus 1 plus 2 times square root of the cardinality of the finite field Q times the genus of the curve. So here Q is the cardinality of the finite field uh, over which your curve is defined and G is the genus of the corresponding curve. So just some small remarks. First of all, um, the Hasse-Weyl bound itself comes also with uh, as a lower bound as well, but I'll be interested in curves of high genus today, and uh, as the genus gets bigger, the um, lower bound and the Hasse-Weyl bound gets negative, so it only tells us that the number of rational points, which is a non-negative, negative integer is bigger or equal to a ne negative number, which is not that interesting. So I just wrote down the upper bound. Um, the second thing to notice maybe is this Q plus 1 term here is the number of rational points that you have on the projective line. So in some sense the Hasse-Weyl bound tells you by how much uh, uh, the number of rational points on an arbitrary curve of genus G can deviate from the number of rational points uh, that you have on the projective line, namely by this quantity in terms of uh, the genus and the cardinality of the finite field. Okay, so once you have this bound, um, of course you can ask how good is this bound. I mean a trivial improvement would be, okay, since the number of rational points is an integer, you can just take this, the integer part of this expression here. I mean, there's a square root, so possibly there might be, uh, this might not be an integer, so this is a trivial improvement. There are also some non-trivial uh, improvements. For instance, uh, theorem by Serre states that you can take the G out from here. And uh, in, I mean, there are some various other improvements for this bound, but basically you can say that uh, if the cardinality uh, of the, fi uh, sorry, if the genus of the curve you're considering is not too big, then the Hasse-Weyl bound is quite good. And in fact, you have examples of uh, curves attaining the Hasse-Weyl bound. Yeah, of course, this can only happen if Q is a square, but I mean, for small uh, genus curves, and when I say small, I always mean in comparison to the cardinality of the finite field over which the curve is defined, uh, we can say that the Hasse-Weyl bound is good. Yeah, so you can't uh, hope to have drastic improvements. Um, but 
so there are curves attaining it, for instance, this curve, and um, yeah, so. Uh, but uh, what happens is, if you look at curves of high genus, then it was noticed by Ihara and by Manin that uh, um, Hasevail bound can be improved substantially. Yeah. So uh, to study this, Ihara in introduced the following quantity. So for a curve, you look at the ratio of its uh, FQ rational points to its genus, and you look what happens to this quotient as you run over uh, all um, uh, smooth, absolutely irreducible uh, projective curves, all defined over a fixed finite field FQ. Yeah? So you fix the finite field FQ, and so to say, you let the genus increase, and you'll see what happens to this ratio in uh, all possible families. So this somehow encodes information about how many uh, rational points you can expect on a curve of high genus, yeah, and, and as a ratio to its uh, uh, genus. And as an immediate consequence of the Hasse-Weil bound, uh, and you see if, uh, if you look at C over G, so if you divide by G, and Q is fixed and G is very large, then the Hasse-Weil bound basically states that that ratio is bounded by 2 times square root of Q. Yeah? So the Hasse-Weil bound immediately gives us an upper bound for this quantity A of Q. It says it's uh, less than or equal to 2 times square root of Q. But as I said, for uh, large genus curves, as was noticed by Ihara and Manin, the Hasse-Weil bound is not good anymore. So you expect that this estimate that you have for this quantity A of Q, which is known as uh, Ihara constant, is not good anymore. In fact, uh, from Ihara's result, you have already this improved lower bound, which is better than uh, upper bound, sorry, which is better than uh, what the Hasse-Weil bound would give you. And in fact, uh, just um, working a bit more using the very same ideas as Ihara had, but just uh, with some additional work. Uh, Trinfeld and Fladut have shown that uh, this uh, Ihara constant A of Q can be upper bounded by root Q minus one. Yeah? So it basically means that um, if you look at uh, really high genus curves, uh, oops, <laughs> okay, if you look at uh, high genus curves, then um, uh, you, what you would expect is that the number of rational points uh, can be at most uh, root q minus 1 times the genus of the curve. Yeah? This is a, uh, the upper bound. And in fact, the trinfeld flooded upper bound is, uh, as of today, still the best known upper bound for this quantity A of q. Okay, uh, so let me talk a bit about uh, lower bounds. Um, so first of all, there is a lower bound by Serre using class field towers. He has shown that this quantity A of Q for any Q is always positive. Yeah? So you have some positive number upper bounded by root Q minus 1, but we don't basically know too much about its exact value. Only in one case we do know its exact value, namely in the case where Q, the cardinality of the finite field, is a square, so it is an even power of a prime. Yeah? So L is a prime power, so in Q is of the form L squared. Then Ihara has shown that uh, A of Q is lower bounded as well by root Q minus 1. So this was just the upper bound given by Trinfeld and Fladet. So together with the Trinfeld Fladet upper bound, we see from this result by Ihara that uh, if Q is of the form L squared, then A of L squared is just equal to square root of L squared minus 1, which is L minus 1. And uh, in the case, so for quadratic finite fields, uh, the, uh, we know basically the exact value of A of Q. Uh, for cubic finite fields, so in the particular case that Q is of the form P cubed, where P is a prime number, there is this lower bound given by uh, Zink. Um, and um, maybe I should say a bit about the various methods used in these three proofs. Uh, so, I mean, basically, I mean, there are some other uh, improvements using class field theory and so on, but basically, uh, on the big scale, these are the three results that we have. Yeah? So, A of Q is always positive. 
uh, over quadratic finite fields you reach the Dirichlet Lodot upper bound and over cubic finite fields you have this um, somewhat uh, weird looking lower bound but in a while I'll show you how um, one can unify the two results of Ihara and Sink. Yeah? And the methods used were um, SER used class field towers, Ihara used modular curves of various types and um, Sink used Shimura surfaces. Yeah? Mm. So uh, what I want to talk about today is some uh, new results. So it's a uh, joint work with uh, Peter Belen, Arnaldo Garcia and Henning Stichtenot. Uh, what we do is we find uh, lower bounds for this quantity A of Q for all non-prime finite fields Q. Yeah? So the method does not work for prime fields, yeah? I mean uh, over finite fields of uh, cardinality which is a prime number, but over all non-prime finite fields it uh, gives us a lower bound, namely the following. So if L is any prime power, uh, then Q is of the form L to the n, where n is at least 2, then we have the following lower bound, A of L to the n can be lower bounded by the harmonic mean of L minus 1 and L to the n minus 1 minus 1. Yeah. So one thing to note is if you take uh, n is equal to 2, I mean where we have Ihara's result, uh, what you get here is the harmonic mean of L minus 1 and L minus 1. So you just get L minus 1, which is just root Q minus 1, which is uh, um, Ihara's lower bound. And if you take n is equal to 3, what you get is exactly this uh, expression uh, that we just saw as things lower bound. Yeah? So for n is equal to 2, you recover Ihara's lower bound. For n is equal to 3, you recover Tsing's lower bound. And moreover, it works for any uh, other n as well. And you can even do better than this. You can say, OK, I'm not too interested in quadratic finite fields because there, by work of Ihara, I know exactly what happens. So let me just restrict to um, finite fields of cardinality L to the n, where n is an odd number of the form 2k plus 1, and it is at least uh, 3, then you can show by very similar methods again that uh, this quantity A of L to the 2k plus 1 can be now bounded by a harmonic mean of L to the k minus 1 and L to the k plus 1 minus 1. Yeah? So one interesting to, thing to note is, I mean, this is the lower bound that we give, and the best known upper bound is the Trinfeld flooded upper bound. And if you look at the lower bound, it's the harmonic mean of two expressions. And the first one of those is, uh, is a bit smaller than uh, the best known upper bound and the second one of the expression of which we take the harmonic mean is a bit bigger than the best known upper bound. Yeah? So the lower bound we give is so to say a harmonic mean of uh, one quantity which is a bit less and the quantity which is a bit above the best known uh, upper bound. So in some sense it's uh, uh, the right uh, order of magnitude but of course uh, uh, might be also far from the true value still. And uh, maybe I should say that, um, I mean, the, the case where the bound is really the, the strongest is in the case where, you, where Q is of the form 2 to the K and K is really large. Yeah? So if you're in characteristic 2 and the cardinality of the finite field is really large, then uh, the lower bound, um, the ratio of the lower bound to the best known upper bound is um, around 94% uh, of it. Okay, Good. so uh, let me talk about how one uh, obtains these lower bounds. I mean, as I said, there are various methods to come up with these lower bounds, but they have all one thing in common, namely what you have to do is you have to come up with uh, sequences of curves, all defined over the same finite field FQ of genus tending to infinity, such that the ratio of the number of rational points on these curves to the genera of those curves tends to something uh, large. Yeah? So this ratio I'll call the limit of, uh, so such a sequence I'll I'll call a tower most of the time and uh, this limit over here I'll call the limit of the tower and as you see the limit of a given tower gives you immediately a lower bound for um, 
the um, um, Ihara constant. Yeah? So what you want to do is you want to find uh, towers which have a positive limit so that you get some non-trivial lower bounds for the Ihara constant. Yeah? And um, how you come up with these curves, um, of course, that's where uh, various different techniques can be used. Okay, so there are various approaches. I mean, class field towers are one of them. And uh, the good thing about class field towers is they work over all finite fields, in particular over prime fields as well. And over prime fields, these are th this is, uh, as far as I know, the only construction giving you uh, towers with uh, uh, non-zero limits. You can use modular curves of various types. And um, these modular curves will give you um, um, good examples of curves over quadratic finite fields. I'll tell you a bit more why uh, you get this quadratic here. And then there is a third approach using explicit equations or recursively defined equations. I'll not, I won't talk too much about it. And in fact, what turns out that uh, is that uh, at least as of today, any uh, sequence of curves that you obtain using explicit equations, given recursively, has a modular interpretation. Yeah? So the reason why these curves are good are, in fact, that they are modular curves. Yeah? So the last one is, so to say, uh, as of today, still a subset of the uh, uh, curves coming from the modular theory, but they have, of course, uh, the advantage that, uh, I mean, they're just given by explicit equations, so they're, uh, um, you can understand them without too much theory, and also if you really want to uh, use these curves somehow, and they're used, for instance, in coding theory and cryptography, it's always good if you have explicit equations if you want to do computations. Okay, so let me talk a bit about uh, modular towers. So, um, as you all know, there are these curves x0 of n. Um, they're defined over uh, the field Q, and they are what are called the modular curves, uh, parameterizing elliptic curves together with some uh, cyclic n isogeny. Yeah? So, th these are classically well known curves, and you can reduce them at various primes, and uh, this n uh, called the level of the modular curve, and as long as the prime at which you want to reduce the curve does not divide the level, you have good reduction, so everything behaves well while passing to the reduction, and um, for the genus, for the genera, I mean, once reducing these curves, the genus doesn't change, or for the genus you have, um, there are well-known formulas for, these, uh, for the genera of these curves, and uh, the nice thing is if you reduce at the prime p, not dividing the level, then uh, you will have many fp squared rational points on this curve. Yeah? And the reason I'll explain in a bit, but basically what you do is you can take sequences of these modular curves with n uh, changing, increasing, and um, you reduce all of them at a fixed prime, not dividing any of the levels. You can find the genera of these curves, and you can uh, also find lower bounds for the, many, for, for the rational points, and it will turn out that you will have many rational points over a quadratic extension over uh, of uh, FP. And um, if you look at the ratio, it turns out that you always get optimal families. Uh, so let me tell you why you have many curves on these uh, uh, points. Uh, the many points, many FQ, FP squared uh, so, sorry, uh, let me tell you why I have many uh, uh, fp squared rational points on these curves. The many points come uh, from uh, the super singular points on these curves. Yeah? So, uh, as I said, um, these curves parameterize elliptic curves together with some additional structure. So, points on these curves correspond to certain isomorphism classes of elliptic curves together with some additional structure. And uh, there is the following fact. If you have a uh, um, elliptic curve over, let's say, a field K, then it is, if it is super singular, then the J invariant of the corresponding uh, elliptic curve has to live in FP squared. Yeah? So there is at least, uh, uh, you can find an um, uh, 
I mean, up to isomorphism, this elliptic curve will be defined over uh, fp squared, where p is the characteristic of the field you're working on. Yeah. So, but now these curves, they were parameterizing isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. Um, so corresponding to super singular elliptic curves, on these curves you will have uh, fp squared rational points. Yeah? So um, at least uh, by just counting how many uh, super singular elliptic curves you have, you can obtain lower bounds for the number of fp squared rational points on these curves. Yeah? And if you do the uh, computation, I mean if you take any sequence uh, of integers tending to infinity and fix a prime not dividing any one of those and if you look at the sequence of all these curves reduced at the fixed prime p then you know that each of them will have many fp squared rational points because you know that you have these super singular points and the genus of these curves can also be calculated and if you look at the ratio you will see that it uh, always tends to uh, square root of p squared minus one which was uh, the twin five flooded upper bound in fact so you um, no matter which sequence of uh, levels you choose, you always obtain in the reduction optimal uh, sequences of curves. And um, the many rational points come uh, from the super singular points, yeah, from the points parameterizing uh, super singular elliptic curves. Okay, uh, let me talk very quickly about recursively defined towers, but as I said, uh, uh, these will turn out to be modular curves, uh, at least that's what uh, has happened in the past. So to define, uh, I mean, to um, define towers recursively, what you do is you fix one polynomial, a bivariate polynomial over a finite field FQ, and you define the curve CN, so I wanted to define a sequence of curves, and the end element in the sequence is just given by um, the very same equation where you change the variables. Yeah? So first uh, you take as variables x0, x1, then as variables x1, x2, you take the very same fixed polynomials, you just change the variables that you use. So you will have a total of n uh, equations in um, n plus one variable, so you get a sequence of curves, of course you have to take a, um, a smooth model of this and so on, but uh, this way you get uh, a sequence of curves and this sequence we'll call um, a tower which is recursively defined by f. Yeah? And um, of course you have um, for such a sequence of curves, in fact, um, uh, the elements on in, in the sequence, they cover the previous ones. Yeah? So for instance, in Cn, I have the coordinates x0 up to xn, but I, if I forget about the last coordinate and just uh, keep track of the first uh, f coordinates from x0 up to xn minus 1, that way I can get a, a natural map from Cn plus 1 to Cn. Yeah? So you have a sequence of coverings of, uh, of curves. And they're recursively defined by uh, one equation. And there are um, various examples of it. For instance, uh, Garcia and Stichtenot came, out, came up with uh, th this equation. Uh, so it were, it's uh, defined over a finite field with L squared element, over a quadratic finite field, uh, which is recursively given by this equation. Yeah? So you take this very same equation, but substitute various uh, variables. And then you can compute the limit of this sequence. And it turns out that uh, it attains the trend five loaded bound. Yeah? So the limit of the, the tau recursively defined by this equation is just uh, root q minus 1. But uh, the bad thing is the genus computation is not too easy. It's, there's a wild ramification and you have to <coughs> keep track of what happens with the ramification in the whole tower. Uh, but you can do this and if you, you can also estimate, count the number of points and if you do that what you get is just this limit over here. And uh, why does this have many rational points? I mean, in this case, there is uh, uh, no higher reason for this, but you can say that, I mean, here, this is the expression for the trace from F, uh, FQ to FL, and this is the expression for the norm from FQ to FL, and here you again have this trace from FQ to FL, and uh, I mean, um, when you play around with this, you can see that you will, at the end, end up with many uh, rational points. Yeah? So, in particular, if I choose for u a coordinate which is in 
f q squared but has non zero trace here um, this is the norm it will push it down to f l this is the trace it will push it down to f l but now I have to solve the equation v to the l plus v is equal to something from f l but the trace from f q to f l is surjective and so on so you see that you get exactly uh, l um, solutions inside f q and none of them will have uh, trace zero and then in the next step you would be plugging them in here um, trace is non-zero so here you would get an element from FL and so on you iterate this on and you get many points in that way okay uh, but uh, the interesting thing is I mean uh, in the past uh, there have been many examples of recursively defined uh, towers which uh, behave uh, somehow very nicely which are optimal but it was shown for all of them uh, that they have uh, um, uh, that they have a modular interpretation yeah so either they were a modular curves of, ellip uh, of elliptic type of Shimura or of Trinfeld type yeah Okay, um, so in fact what Elkis has shown is that, uh, I mean, I told you how uh, when you take, uh, look at these modular curves of various levels and reduce them at, uh, at a good prime, you get optimal sequences. What Elkis has shown is in fact, if you look at this particular sequence, you know, so you fix some s, some integer s, and you look at uh, the modular curves, of level s to the k where s is fixed and k is increasing yeah, so you get a sequence of integers as levels going to infinity uh, he showed that uh, this sequence can be defined recursively yeah? and that's in fact where all the recursive equations up to now uh, come from Oops. Yeah, so why um, um, are, can these curves be defined uh, recursively so um, just let me shortly uh, sketch it. So what you do is basically, uh, if you look at points on these curves, yeah, I mean, not at the cusp, but if you look at, uh, uh, let's say, the finite points of these curves, then they correspond to equivalence classes of elliptic curves together with a cyclic subgroup of order s to the k. Yeah? Or if you want, uh, they correspond to elliptic curves together with an isogeny. Yeah, uh, an isogeny of, I mean, you can either think of an, uh, an S to cyclic S to the K isogeny, or you can just keep track of the uh, subgroup uh, of the kernel of the isogeny. And uh, in fact, um, I mean, the levels, I mean, the uh, cyclic subgroup that you had, or the kernels of these isogenies, they were, uh, they had orders S to, S to the power K. Right, so there are cyclic subgroups of order s to the k, and for such a cyclic subgroup, you have a filtration, of course, in terms of uh, cyclic subgroups of uh, smaller orders, and then you can translate what this means in terms of isogenies. Just means that if you have a cyclic s to the k isogeny, you can write it as a composition of uh, k cyclic s isogenies. Yeah? So uh, you have a cyclic s isogeny here, another one here, and so on. Of course, you have to make sure that uh, they um, somehow um, glue nicely together. Yeah? So n not that one of them is the dual of the other and those kinds of things. So you need that uh, in any sequence of two of them, um, they should, uh, the composition of any two of them gives you a cyclic S squared isogeny. But if you do that, you see that any cyclic S to the K isogeny, you can write basically as a sequence of K cyclic S isogeny. So uh, in the sequence that you have uh, of these elliptic curves, uh, you see that uh, consecutive ones are related by a cyclic S isogeny, and uh, if two elliptic curves are related by a cyclic S isogeny, then their J invariance should satisfy what is called the modular polynomial of level N, right? So uh, the J invariant of E1 and the J invariant of uh, EI plus 1 um, satisfy uh, this modular polynomial of level N, this phi S uh, U comma V, yeah, this um, integer. Uh, coefficient uh, bivariate polynomial and um, so you can think of the J invariance of these elliptic curves as your coordinates so what you do is you're in some sense iterating uh, this very same polynomial over and over again yeah? 
So that's the recursive structure. Yeah? So you have x1 and you have a covering of it, you have x0 of s and then of course you have a map down there. I mean this would be so to say an elliptic curve together with an isogeny you are up here and then you can look at the isogenous one and map down here again. Yeah? So here you would have so to say as coordinate the j invariant of the first one, j1, j2 and you can iterate this and uh, if you take the fiber product here of, or if you take the compositum of the corresponding function fields you get the function field of the uh, modular curve of one higher level and if you iterate this over and over again you get basically x0 s to the k. Okay, so uh, let me talk about uh, Trinfeld modular varieties. So, I mean, as you all know, I mean, you have this uh, inclusion over here, and in the Trinfeld case, I mean, you fix a, a polynomial ring over a finite field, and then you have this corresponding world over here, and uh, elliptic curves, so to say, were corresponding to Z lattices inside C, and there you had the choice of rank 1 or rank 2, uh, Z lattices. And uh, if you look in the corresponding uh, Drinfeld modular setup, what you would be now looking are FLT lattices inside C infinity. But the nice thing here is that you have lattices of arbitrarily high rank. Yeah? Whereas, I mean, here the dimension of R uh, of C over R is 2, so you only have lattices of uh, one, rank 1 or 2, but here the corresponding dimension is infinite, so you have uh, lattices of arbitrarily high uh, rank. And this will be useful uh, for us in the construction of um, uh, of these curves with ha which have many rational points over uh, also non-square finite fields. Yeah, I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Let me first talk a bit about the rank 2 case, I mean to uh, fix some notation. Uh, I mean A will be just this polynomial ring. If you fix a prime P of A, I'll denote the corresponding uh, uh, quotient ring by F sub P, yeah, so this is a capital P, and this will be in general isomorphic to the finite field with L to the D elements, where D is the degree of this prime P I've chosen over here, and I'll denote by FP to the power 2 the unique quadratic extension of this finite field. And in total analogy with, uh, um, with these um, elliptic modular curves that I had uh, in the classical setup and the Drinfeld setup I have for any level n which will now be a polynomial I can associate um, a, a, an algebraic curve which is defined over the rational function field over FL which parameterizes uh, so it's called the Drinfeld modular curve and it parameterizes rank two Drinfeld modules together with the cyclic n isogeny. Yeah? And similarly, uh, you ha it has good reduction at all primes not dividing the level. So uh, you can reduce modulo a certain prime not dividing the level and then you get uh, curves defined over finite fields. And this again will have many rational points and behave nice asymptotically. Yeah, so you can show that if you look at this, such a reduction, you will have many rational points again over a quadratic extension of F sub P. Yeah, or asymptotically, there's this result of Gekeler which says that uh, if you fix any prime P, this is the prime you want to reduce by, and if you take any sequence of polynomials uh, uh, in your polynomial ring, this will be the se sequence of levels of these modular curves that you want to have, such that uh, the prime doesn't divide any of the levels so that you have good reduction, and the degree of the levels go to infinity so that you get a sequence of curves of genus tending to infinity, then the corresponding sequence of curves obtained by reducing these curves x0 and k at this fixed prime p will attain the Trinfeld Ladot bound over a quadratic extension of fp. Yeah? So no matter which sequence you take, um, you will get an optimal tower. And if you think of the simplest possible, uh, let's say you take for n you take a consecutive, you fix, I mean, Elkis has shown that again, if the levels, if they are just powers of a fixed uh, polynomial Q, then the tower has a recursive structure. It can be given recursively by iterating the same equation. And the norm trace tower that I showed before, for instance, is the simplest example that you can think of. I mean, this um, 
this polynomial whose um, powers you take, just take the simplest one, just take t, and then you have to reduce by something relatively prime to t, so just take t minus 1, so if you take uh, the sequence of these modular curves, reduce them at t minus 1, then you get a sequence of curves which is optimal, and it uh, basically corresponds to this uh, norm trace tower that I talked about before. I mean, the norm trace tower is just a, a degree L minus 1 cover of it. Okay, uh, and another thing to mention is, uh, I mean, uh, you have the elliptic modular curves, and uh, as a generalization of those, you have the Shimura curves, and uh, for Drinfeld modular curves, you can do an analogous uh, generalization. What you would obtain are modular curves of the elliptic sheaves, and uh, Papikian showed that uh, if you look at these modular curves of the elliptic sheaves of rank 2, then you get a sequence of curves which is again optimal. Okay, uh, so let me talk about uh, the corresponding result um, over uh, non-prime finite fields. Yeah? What is the main idea there? So first of all, the question would be, a natural question to ask would be, okay, you get many uh, FQ square, you get many rational points over a quadratic extension, but what is so special about this quadratic extension? Where does the two come from? And um, the main reason behind that is you get your many rational points from the super singular points and the super singular points are defined over a quadratic extension yeah, which basically comes from the fact that uh, you're looking at elliptic curves which are rank 2 lattices or you look at Rinfeld modules of rank 2 yeah? so this uh, rank um, of the lattice somehow reflects in itself in um, the degree of the field of definition uh, of the super singular elements. Yeah? So there is the following theorem by Gekeler. If you take any super singular Dinfeld module of rank R, let's say, and of, let's say, characteristic P, if it is super singular, then it is isomorphic to one which is defined over L, which is where L is a degree R extension of uh, FP. Yeah? So um, if you look at rank R Grinfeld modules, they will always be defined, so to say, over, uh, if you look at super singular rank R Grinfeld modules, they will always be defined over a degree R extension. Yeah? So the idea would be then if you look at the space parameterizing rank R Drinfeld modules, yeah, I mean, in some uh, correct, uh, character, uh, positive uh, finite characteristic, then you would have uh, points corresponding to the super singular objects, and th those super singular objects are defined over a degree R extension, so you would get many. Um, rational points over a degree r extension. Yeah? So you would get many fp to the r rational points. But the problem is, if you look at the space parameterizing Grinfeld modules of higher rank, uh, that space is not a curve anymore. Yeah? It's in general r minus 1 dimensional and not a curve anymore. So the way to uh, go around this is, okay, what you have is if you look at the space parameterizing rank R Drinfeld modules together with some additional structure, you will have many um, FQ to the R rational points, yeah? but um, it will be a higher dimensional space and the idea is just to look at curves on, those, on the space passing through those many uh, FQ to the R rational points. Yeah? So, um, so you have, let's say, a higher dimensional variety with many fq to the r rational points. Are there some natural curves passing through those many fq to the r rational points? So uh, let me tell you wh which curves, I mean, that, that was the basic idea. Let me tell you which curves we uh, looked at. So the idea is, let me first look at the space parameterizing all Trinfeld modules of a certain rank R. Yeah? So this will be, so to say, the analog of my x1 in the previous case. And uh, there will be certain uh, fq to the R rational points coming from the super singular ones. And um, let me first describe a curve in this um, analog of x1 and then I can lift this curve up to uh, analogs of x0 n, so to say, by putting some additional structure. And let me first tell you what is uh, the curve that I have at the bottom most, uh, that I take on the bottom most variety, so to say. So if you have um, 
so let's say I fix the characteristic to be t minus 1, so a Drinfeld module of rank n will be, um, I mean, is uniquely determined by the image of t, so it will be, um, um, yeah, an expression, I mean, t this tau here is now the q Frobenius, so it's uh, corresponding to this uh, endomorphism, so to say. And what I do is, I don't want to really work with uh, isomorphism classes of elliptic curves, because then I always have to um, look at everything up to isomorphism, so I lose, use a somewhat um, stronger equivalence. Yeah? What I do is in any isomorphism class there will be, uh, I mean in any isomorphism class of a Brinfeld module there will be uh, one um, element which, has, uh, which is Monique so to say with leading coefficient 1. Yeah? So instead of looking at isomorphism classes I look at uh, normalized Brinfeld modules. Yeah? So I assume that the leading coefficient is 1. Yeah? But of course in one class there will be more than uh, one uh, Drinfeld module with leading coefficient 1, so usually you wouldn't distinguish them, but now I look at them as separate things, but this helps me so that I don't have to all the time look at everything up to uh, isomorphism, instead I look at normalized rank n Drinfeld modules. Um, so the characteristic is t minus 1, so phi will be super singular if the multiplication by t minus 1 map is a purely inseparable map of degree l to the n. Yeah? So phi t minus 1 should be tau to the n, and if you compare phi t minus 1 would be the same expression without the 1 at the end here, so for this to be equal to tau to the n you need that g1 up to gn minus 1 are all equal to 0. Yeah, so this will be your unique super singular point. Yeah? So you have one super singular point, so to say, corresponding to all coordinates being equal to zero. So what I now want to do is I want to find the one-dimensional sublocus of the whole variety. Yeah? So I want um, some curve, uh, I mean these are my coordinates, I want to find some curve, it should be one-dimensional. I want it to pass through this one super singular point, so that, um, I mean, I have one super singular point, uh, which is uh, um, f q to the r rational, and also when I lift it by adding some um, additional level structure, all the lifts will stay, still stay fq to the r rational. So I want this curve to pass through this one point, 0, 0, 0, 0. And, um, I mean, the last one is not too crucial, but it's, uh, uh, it makes uh, somehow computations and finding equations easier. I want that um, this um, uh, one-dimensional sublocus that I chose is invariant under isogenies. Yeah? Because what I want to do is, uh, I mean, I have this bottommost variety, I choose a curve on it, passing through this one super singular point, and uh, then I want to consider uh, a, a variety covering this bottom one, which parameterizes Drinfeld modules together with some additional structure, and I want to pull back, so to say, this curve, I want to pull it up here, but instead of pulling it all the way up here, you might think of doing it recursively, right? Pulling it up and then you can push it down again to the isogenous one and so on, yeah? So what you want is, so to say, you want the correspondence which you can iterate. So for that you need that uh, um, this sublocus that you choose is invariant under isogenies, yeah? It says only necessary if you want the uh, defining equation to be uh, given by, uh, I mean, if you want this to have a recursive nature. Okay, and um, so there is one natural candidate for it, uh, namely the locus of what I call a weakly super singular Drinfeld module. So in general, the multiplication by t minus 1 of a super singular Drinfeld module uh, was a purely inseparable map of degree l to the n. Now I call it Drinfeld module weakly super singular if the multiplication by t minus 1 map is uh, purely inseparable of degree at least l to the n minus 1. Yeah? So it's at least l to the n minus 1, which also includes the case where the multiplication by t minus 1 map is purely inseparable of degree l to the n, which was the super singular case. Um, but it is in general a one-dimensional family, right? It will be, uh, so I want that phi t minus 1 is purely inseparable of degree n minus 1, so it's of this form which requires that g2 up to gn minus 1 is equal to 0, yeah? So the super singular locus was the one where g1 up to gn minus 1 are all 0, 
but um, now I look at the one-dimensional sublocus of the whole variety corresponding to the points where g2 up to gn minus 1 is equal to 0. And um, the property of being super singular is also invariant under isogenies, yeah? so, um, which is what I also wanted to have, so to say. Uh, yeah, so this is, so to say, the one-dimensional sublocus inside the uh, whole space MR parameterizing Grinfeld module set I chose. And then I put some additional level structure. Yeah, there you have uh, lots of choices. Just uh, as an example, I chose uh, isogenies of this form. Yeah, so let lambda be an isogeny given by an additive polynomial of this form. And I want this to be a T isogeny. Yeah, so I want uh, the kernel of this isogeny to be annihilated by m the multiplication by T map, which means that this lambda should be a right factor of phi sub T. And um, if you look at what this means, phi sub T was just uh, this um, polynomial over here. Uh, I've not written it down here, but it's basically this with the plus one over here. And you want that tau minus u is a right factor of it, and it's not easy to see. It is very easy to see that this, in fact, gives you the following relation between the u, which was what determined your isogeny, and uh, your g1, which was the one coordinate that you have in, had in your super, uh, in, in your Trinfeld module, weakly super singular Trinfeld module. You have this uh, relation where n sub k is just the expression for the norm from fq to the k to uh, fq, yeah, or fl to the k to fl, sorry. And so you get this uh, expression. So tau minus u will be uh, a t isogeny for the Drinfeld module uh, tau to the n plus g1 tau to the n minus 1 plus 1 if and only if this condition is verified, is satisfied. Yeah? And you see already that you can write the G1 in terms of the U. So um, the space up there, parameterizing uh, weakly supersingular Greenfeld modules together with uh, T isogeny of this form, I mean, it is a, a rational curve and the parameter is given by U. And G1 you can just express in terms of the U. Right? So G <laughs> And then you can also see what the I mean, if you would go down again, what would be the corresponding uh, isogenous uh, Drinfeld module? So if lambda is an isogeny from phi to psi, so psi will again be weakly super singular. So the only non-zero term will be the h1, the coefficients of tau to the n minus one. And to have an isogeny just means that you have this relation over here, and then you can work out the relation that has to hold between uh, h1, g1, and u. So you can again express your uh, h1 just in terms of the u again. Yeah, so that way uh, you can ex express your uh, g1, uh, that was the super singular, uh, weekly super singular Renfeld module you started with, in terms of the u that was there in the isogeny, which forms, uh, um, so to say, uh, uh, which is, so to say, a coordinate for this rational curve uh, x0 uh, t. And you can also express h1 in terms of it. So let me just uh, change the variables. Instead of u, I just used 1 over u. So you have um, this uh, graph, I mean this um, inclusion of function fields. So this was the function field of the curve parameterizing normalized uh, weakly super singular Trinfeld modules. This uh, is the curve parameterizing those Trinfeld modules together with the T isogeny of the particular form tau minus V. And this would be if you go down to the isogenous Trinfeld module. Okay, and then what you can do is just iterate this correspondence. Yeah? So iterating this correspondence would mean you take these equations and you, uh, I mean, uh, you iterate these equations. Yeah? So recursively you would be iterating uh, this equation. Yeah? And if you do that, uh, what you get is uh, this um, uh, the sequence of curves that I talked about at the very beginning. Um, that 
perform well over non-prime finite fields. Yeah? And you see, I mean, the um, super singular point was zero, so if you set this equal to zero, you would have to solve uh, what happens here. So here you have the norm expression uh, from FL uh, to the n to FL, so you want the norm of something plus one to be zero, so the norm of something should be minus one, so you see that you have exactly as many solutions as the degree, so the super singular point really splits in the whole sequence. Yeah? And then you can do some variation of this, and then you obtain this other example that works over uh, um, non-prime finite fields, which are not squares. Uh, I guess that's uh, all I wanted to say.